They call it the Asus Tough Dash F15, and this model has a few things I really like and a few things that I'm really wondering why they did what they did with this year's Tough lineup. So let's get right into it. First, the things that I like are the aluminum top cover and the really well laid out and designed keyboard deck and bottom panel. I think the build quality and ventilation on this laptop is much improved to last year. So these vents actually lead somewhere as opposed to last year's model in the Tough A15, where they were basically just places where a grill would have gone, but the holes weren't completely drilled through, so the ventilation was quite terrible, which made the thermals very bad. The thermals in this model are much better this year, actually improved by over 10 degrees Celsius, on the benchmark tests. Now, another thing is that it is a little bit thinner and lighter than last year's model, which I like a lot as well. The edges are very nice on this laptop. They're well machined. There's no sharp or sticky points on the laptop. Everything is well designed and well put together. They have the power port here, the RJ45, the HDMI port, USB type A, USB type C, and a headphone jack. On the other side, we have two USB type A's, as well as the Kensington lock. And there's a vent on both the right side Side panel as well as the left side panel and on the back of the chassis as well as on the top of the keyboard deck. So this laptop is well ventilated especially compared to last year's model. Now taking a look at the screen flex as we do as standard it's got quite a bit of screen flex not gonna lie and it has a little bit of screen flex here down along the bottom of the screen. Now the keyboard deck is nice it's got some nice soft matte touch finish keys they are snappy and responsive they have that nice long travel of a gaming laptop, not uh, like, for instance, like the MacBook Pro or the Razer Blade 15, where it's a bit of a shorter travel. These have some good long travel. It's a quiet keyboard. You have a number of great function keys along the top of the keyboard deck. You can control your keyboard backlighting, your fan speed, put it into airplane mode or sleep mode, all from the function keys at the top of the keyboard deck. A full shift key, toggle left, right, up, down good space bar, and a eh, rather small trackpad. It is nice though, it's very responsive, it's got good click and touch sensitivity, but it is a little small for my preferences. Before we forget, the flex between the keyboard deck and the trackpad is minimal as well. And there's a little flex up here where this vent is, but it's not anything uh, that should stop your show. It's not a showstopper, as they say. Although the speakers are only underneath, they sound actually pretty excellent. The color gamut range on this laptop is much improved over last year's model. It has a much brighter screen, it has much better color accuracy, and it has much better color gamut range. So big thumbs up from a creative professional for those improvements. The upgrade path on this laptop is really simple as well. You just pull off the bottom cover, it removes easily, you can swap the RAM, you can swap the SSD, all of that is very simple, it's not a complicated process. And of course, just make sure you touch something metal uh, to kind of de-static yourself before you start grabbing the internal components of your laptop. And those upgrades would help you out quite a bit in Photoshop, and we'll get to that in just a minute. But first, Cinebench R20, as you can see, because this is a not a multi-core processor, it's four cores and eight threads for the i7-11370H processor. So because it's not a multi-core processor, Cinebench R20 and R23 are a little laggy in my opinion. If you're curious about the exact price and availability of this model as we're heading through the video, you can head down in the description below and click that link. Now, if you do make a purchase of that link, I will get a small commission, but at no extra cost to you. And that's what keeps this channel alive and the helpful content coming your way. Now, as you move into the Geekbench single core, this laptop really shines. It outshines a lot of the big laptops that get a lot of praise and a lot of excitement, and it's right behind the Apple MacBook Pro M1. As you move on to multi-core though, again, it drops down the chart because it's only four cores and eight threads. And I feel like I'm filming a video in 2000 2019 or 2018, like 2015. I'll give it 2015. All right, I ramble on. 2015, because four cores and four eight threads was more of a big deal then. It's not anymore. We got eight and 16 and 10 and 20 and 12 and 24. Why does this thing have four cores and eight threads? I don't know. But the benefit of that, is there a benefit of that? 
I don't know. As we get into the 3D modeling charts, you can see it sits around in the middle of the charts. And it's about 30 points behind the leader. Now, this is actually decent because that laptop is about double the price of this one. That is the Gigabyte Aero 15XC with an i7-10875H with eight cores, 16 threads, and the RTX 3070 GPU. This is about half the price here, this Asus Tough Dash F15. So that's a pretty solid score. Moving on to the Autodesk Maya, you can see it's only about 27 points behind the leader. And then for PTC Creo, it's only about 15 points behind the leader. So this laptop does have really good single core performance to complement the RTX 3060 GPU. So with that in mind, where does this laptop win out? Single core. It is a very solid single core performance laptop. So no, you're not having all the cores and all the threads, but you're going to have really solid single in-app performance. Now moving on to SolidWorks, any laptop without a Quadro GPU is going to struggle, and that's the same case we see here. Moving on to After Effects, you can see this laptop does actually perform very well, getting almost 800 points, which is only roughly 20 points behind last year's model. Now that amount sound absolutely crazy. Why would we downgrade from last year's model? Now the confusion for all of us is why didn't they just upgrade to the new Ryzen 5000 series processor rather than giving us an Intel processor. I don't know, but this is what we have in front of us. It's a toss up because this year's model is going to have better build quality, a more color accurate screen, a little bit thinner and lighter, but you're not going to have all the performance that came from that Ryzen 7 processor like you got last year. So I'm, I'm a bit torn, okay? I like the build quality, I like the color accuracy. If you wanna see a head-to-head -head video between the Asus Zephyrus G14 and the Asus Tough Dash, which are both about $1,500, but with Ryzen versus Intel, I'm gonna link that video up in the YouTube cards above once it comes out. I think that's gonna be a really fun video. For the Premiere Pro 4K export and the DaVinci Resolve 4K export, you see it has good times, but not great. It's about three minutes out of Premiere Pro and about 10 minutes out of DaVinci Resolve. Now keep in mind, I am using the free version of DaVinci Resolve for that test, so you can kind of understand where my tests are coming from. Taking a look at Photoshop, it scores about a 733, which is an excellent benchmark for Photoshop. But keep in mind that if you upgrade this laptop from 16 to 40 gigs of RAM, you're gonna get about a 70 point increase in performance. So if you go ahead and swap out the eight gig stick in this laptop, cause you can actually only swap out one of the RAM slots, you'll be able to get 40 gigs of RAM and about a 70 point increase in performance. So if you're looking to make some upgrades and get this a little better performance in Photoshop, that'd be a good upgrade. The upgrade path, like I said, is rather simple pull the screws off, pull the bottom cover off, swap the components, and you're good to go. This laptop has a 76 watt hour battery and actually optimizes it pretty well. While you're doing productivity tasks from the Passmark productivity benchmark, you can get about four hours and 21 minutes at half brightness. For streaming video playback on YouTube, I got about five hours and 59 minutes. For Photoshop and Premiere Pro, it was rather poor though. It really pushed the computer hard in my Photoshop Puget Systems benchmark test, which I ran on repeat until the battery went dead. That lasted about an hour and 26 minutes. Minutes. And then for the Premiere Pro 4K playback test, I put a clip on loop and it looped for about an hour and 27 minutes. So definitely need to bring that charger along if you're going to be doing creator tasks. You can probably get away with it if you're going to be doing productivity or streaming video. Just keep that in mind. Links if you're ready to make a purchase, likes if this video has brought you some value, and subs if you don't miss out on the future uploads. I'll see you here in the next one.